Oh, fantastic, Jerry. Excellent. Can you talk so we can hear you? <laughs> yes. Can you hear me? Okay. We are all set. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. Okay. So I think we're ready to start. Let me say it again kindly. If you're, kindly, if you're attending the session, can you please close the video? You, and the speaker only will put the video on when they talk. In the meantime, close your video, please, and uh, mute yourself and close the microphone. Fantastic. Okay. So we are ready to go. So thank you very much again for joining this session. So I'll give a brief introduction on behalf of the chair, uh, which is myself, Rebecca, Peter, Simon, Holly, and Varsha. Next slide, Varsha, please. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction about the agenda, which you can see in the page, in the session page. I, I just put the link. And in the session page, you can also find a link to this slide as well as a link to the Google Doc with collaborative notes. So I'm going to give a brief presentation of the working group that I'm going to hand over to Vasha, who will share a set of lighting, uh, lightning talk. And then we're going to have a panel discussion with questions from the audience. Next one. Thank you. This is just briefly uh, to make sure that you all know uh, what this working group has delivered, which is um, a registry of standards, repository, and policy, which are described and connected. And so the output of the working group has been a registry, as well as a set of recommendation for different stakeholders on how to use this registry. And the guidance are for consumer, of these standards, repository, and policy so that they can discover, select them, use them with confidence because they are described and they are connected. And the recommendation also help producer of these resources. So the developer of the standard, the developer of the repository or of this policy to make sure that they can make the resource visible to people, perhaps even outside their direct disciplines. And so that they can be more adopted, more cited. Next slide, please. In the next slide, it's just a, a really a brief illustration of uh, how the registry is being used so far, because that's important to set the context of for this session. So the, the, the registry is used through its interface as well as is a, a programmatic access. We have several community who have created, for example, collection of repository and standard that their community has developed, like illustrating the example one by the astronomy. And you can see the graph, the registry provides a graph that shows this standard, this repository and their relations. Example number two uh, shows how policymakers have created their they have this they created their data policy, registered the policy on fair sharing, and linked the policy to the standard or the registry they uh, recommend. But more specifically, uh, this shows the educational use of the registry, which help uh, policymakers to see what's out there in terms of standard and registry, but also understand how this resource evolve over time if there is a new one that come to the fore they need to be pointed to. The example number three shows how um, a different number of uh, tools, services, resources in the fair ecosystem are using the content of the registry, the standard, the description of the standard, the repository, the policy and their relation to inform uh, their, for example, a fair assessment or uh, to create this knowledge graph or to provide information to users to create data management plan. Next slide, please. This brings me to the reason why we're doing this session. Because of this adoption, this use, we received feedback from different user community that we need to improve the description of these resources, the description of the standard, the description of the repository, the description of the policy. And those are description, descriptive metadata that the user wants to see in the fair sharing registry and perhaps in other registry too. So that's why we are having, we are doing two activity. One is to uh, map this uh, description of the repository across the different initiative, which is the scope of this session. And I'm going to go in a little bit more detail in the next slides. 
but we are also doing um, um, trying to announce the description of the policy in, in this case specifically from funders and publisher to make sure that they are very well described and they are comparable and this is the scope of another session which we have on Thursday uh, which is led by the funder interest group and the data policy standardization interest group so join us on Thursday if we want to hear more about that my next slide which is my last slide brings uh, us back to the reason for these sessions so to describe repository there is a number of initiatives they have defined features and i'm using this word just to refer to criteria functionality uh, uh, good repository guidelines which a, a series of groups have developed and they are very important and it's why we are bringing them together in this session because we want to understand what they've done why they've done but especially what we want to understand is can we map this landscape of initiative and can we identify a common set of metadata descriptors for repository that we can use to announce the description of the repository in fair sharing or in any other registry of the repository thank you very much Varsha. this is my last slide so i hand over to you uh, to introduce uh, our different speakers thank you um. Thanks, Susanna. Right, so I'm just going to uh, move everyone straight on to our lightning talks. And can I invite, let me just get to the right thing. Can I please invite uh, Matt and Chris to uh, unmute themselves? And they're going to be giving us uh, their overview of the um, features from the publisher's view. Um, I'll just remind all of our lightning talk because that we are going to stick to a very strict five minutes. So over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Marcia. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Matt Cannon. I'm the head of open research at, based at Taylor & Francis. Um, today, I'm representing a group of publishers who've been working together on this important topic. Um, and you can see their details on the screen now. I've got a few minutes to talk you through what we've been doing. So this project has been going on for several years and was previously presented at VP14 in Helsinki. And we've been coming together to compile a list of features which we feel are important for authors to consider when choosing a repository for their data, where there are not specific practices already in place for their kind of data or standard. Um, and you can see more detail of this on some of the following slides. Um, before I go on, I should say the latest version of the preprint that we've been working on was shared online earlier this month um, based on feedback that we'd received, some of which was from groups who are also presenting in this session. Um, and you can add on, on the slide. And next slide, please, Varsha. So what was our motivation for doing this? So publishers have a role in scientific communication, sharing of research, um, which is all a key part of open science, um, supporting efforts to make research more reproducible and transparent. Um, a key pillar of open science and open research is data sharing. And there's been a lot of work um, around um, promoting fair data principles. Publishers have been rolling out data sharing policies to key communities for a number of years. Um, and in doing that, we get lots of feedback from different subjects and different groups. And one of the key things that we know is still needed is resources and training for researchers in many areas. Uh, these include writing data availability statements, how to cite um, and link data objects, but also selecting repositories to store their data for the long term. Um, this isn't something new that we've decided to do. Publishers already provide information about how to select repositories to authors, both on author services uh, and um, support websites, and in reply to queries that we get from prospective authors, often when faced with one of our more open data sharing policies. Um, however, a lot of the um, information that we provide is not necessarily um, transparent and can be quite varied. So this was an opportunity to come together and be more collaborative and transparent. Um, we did want to note that we agree that authors should be able to choose the best place to store their data and also that institutional or subject repositories may often be the best place for them to do that. Um, and as publishers, um, we are often competitive in many situations, but um, in this circumstance, we felt there was benefit in coming together to support open science and support authors with sharing their data um, and meet open science goals. And we also feel that working together in this way is more likely to create a simple solution, which is easy to adopt. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is not the only effort um, to look at repository features, as Susanna mentioned, um, and many of the other uh, highly notable efforts are also talking in this session, so I won't go into too much detail. Obviously, Core Trip Trust Seal is a mechanism that is used to badge repositories who meet certain criteria, and this can be really beneficial for authors who want peace of mind when sharing their data in the long term. Also, um, Core have um, been working on their criteria to advise repositories, but all repositories are not just data repositories. Um, also, the work of Elixir and the Trust Principles are great resources. All of these different efforts are looking to place requirements on repositories, um, all looking at different ways, um, different kind of elements, sorry. Um, and to show the similarities between the, the different criteria, um, the authors of the preprint put together a table earlier this year, which shows um, the, the, the similarities. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Vasha, please. Um, this is the, the mapping table that we put together. So it's really small. Um, I do think you can expand this if you want, or there is a link to it in the preprint. But in the in the blue columns are some of the features that the publishers put together. And then you can see the, the ticks in the other columns which show how, um, whether these features are also represented in the other lists. Um, there are two uh, features that we've called out in yellow. Um, and I'll go on to talk more about these on the next slide, please, Basha. Um, so there were two features that our work highlighted, which are not included in the other efforts. And these are quite specifically information that publishers want, want to know to help advise authors. So the first is what we've called data deposition requirements. Um, so this is very simply about who can use that repository. For example, if it is an institutional repository, then we need to know that unless you're at the University of Bristol, you can't use that resource, for example. Um, also around some of their data access for peer review. So whether authors want to embargo their data only to share it at the point of article publication, or whether the journal in question operates double blind peer review and you need to balance the openness of the data with the closeness of the, the peer review. Um, and just to say that in this work, we're really looking to support journal authors and that's why we've pulled out these key criteria. So I think final slide, please, Marcia. So. I just wanted to say that I'm really pleased that we're all in a room having this discussion. It would have been great if we were all in Edinburgh together. Um, but this work does primarily represent the, the work and thinking of publishers to date. Um, we have made efforts to be collaborative um, and get input and we have received um, lots of comments and input from other groups but we realized that this may not have been comprehensive as it is quite a challenge to get input from the whole um, all of the, the stakeholders involved we have recently updated the preprint which outlines the motivations that we have um, and hopefully provides clarity to other stakeholders um, it's still not the version and will continue to be collaborative um, and i look forward to the the rest of the session and the ongoing discussion Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, okay, if I could invite Sarah to come and join us, please. Hello, um, I hope you can hear me. And Vasha, I have deleted a slide and updated the other one. If you could quickly refresh, that would really be great. Thank you. Unfortunately, um, no, I've downloaded no. the slides based on what oh, they were. Okay, thank so you. I'm no, afraid they are as they were. <laughs> no, so, so people should still see the, the link then. Thank you, Vasha. So, um, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I am Sira Sarah Sarantivijay, and I am representing the Elixir um, Data and Interoperability Coordination work on the technical details at the Elixir Hub. Um, we have, as mentioned before, thank you, Matthew, I really loved your table, um, the Elixir Core Data Resources selection um, with the criteria mentioned in the the, the image here on legal funding, quality, immune, community impact, and scientific focus. These are the criteria listed in the articles that I have put the link here. And if we could go on to the next slide, I'd like to introduce you to um, why we are actually doing the Elixir Core Data Resources or CDR. So um, I am very honored when I look at the, the agenda and I see so many other um, panelists and experts in this session. 
And one thing that I've learned on this job is that all these different um, criteria for selection are, are very vital and critical um, based on the different motivations here. So for Elixir, we have defined the criteria to select the core data resources as one element to, to drive the mission for the FAIR data for a life at Elixir, which is an organization of um, 20 three member states, so we operate across Europe and some non-European countries. Um, and we try to drive this on the sustainable basis. So we identify that there are some reference data sets that needs to be maintained in the longer term, but also how to use these data sets, um, databases and repositories together. So the criteria is set in a way that it is supported by the technical platforms at Elixir, which are the group of people driving the implementations of this. And between this, we have also defined the recommendation, recommended interoperability resources, for example, how to ontology map terms in the data resources, how to mark up your schema um, on the data resources, just so that all these fair data can be completely fair um, or and fair enough to function. So next slide, please. So I was asked to uh, to look at the Elixir um, CDR criteria and the other criteria here. And the, the two things that, that jumped out of my mind as the reference is we get asked a lot on um, how fair is the, the, the CDR criteria. And it is important to stress that we don't just measure the fairness of the resource because we also have to look at the community impact and the scientific value of it in order to consider um, the, the best strategy to sustain the, the data resources that are important to the mission at Elixir. So we decided to make this table because I, I, I think if I were to try to do any tables, I, I, I think what Matthew had already answered a lot of questions that, that, that could be answered. But here, as um, fair as, how fair is the CDR criteria, we can, we, we can put out the, 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 the four metrics the, here of the selection criteria of CDR. And you can see that we actually identified elements of fairness in the CDR criteria here. Um, so for the motivation at Elixir, we actually have to, to drive it based on um, the decision support and value adoption. So, um, and if we were to move on to the next slide, we decided to benchmark ourselves in the de in more details with the core trust seal here. And, and as mentioned that because it's driven by the different motivation, these different criteria, um, uh, we observed that the core trust seal reflected are in, in the CDR indicators but some of the CDR indicators are not in the core trust seal and that's for for very good reason from the core trust seal too because core trust seal and CDR are designed to do different things. So FAIR principles, core trust seal and CDR aims um, were all different but they do align when we look at the details of the criteria that, that, that we just looked at in these two slides here. If I could go to the next slide please. So then when I look at the CDR currently, we have to plan to, to, to try to identify as needed. And these are the current list of the core, the core data resources at Elixir. But for the next step, as mentioned that because we're driving the sustainability of the data resources in the network, we also have been identified as the criteria to be adopted by the Global Biodata Coalition and the collaboration between the GBC and CDR here are vital to the global community, not just within the Elixir network. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, to the next. And if I could invite uh, Mustafa to join us. Thank you. Hi, Varsha. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you see my video? Yep, thanks. So, uh, thanks for the invitation to talk uh, at this session. First, um, I would like to define a number of key concepts that would help uh, the understanding of the rest of my presentation. Trustworthiness is at the center of the relationship between a digital preservation repository and its designated community of users. Trustworthy Digital Repository's mission 
is to preserve digital objects for the long term and ensure their understandability and reusability to the designated community. A certified trustworthy digital repository is transparently and verifiably assessed by a third party. Next slide, please, Varsha. Core Trust Seal is actually two things. Um, I see that the layout of my slide has gone wrong on this export, but that's not a, a big issue. I think you can still read it. Core Trust Seal is actually two things. First, the 16 core requirements for trustworthy data repositories define the essential characteristics of trustworthy data repositories. They are based and fully aligned with the OAIS, the Open Archival Information System Reference Model, which is an ISO standard. They really take a holistic approach to trustworthiness, covering, as you can see in the diagram on the right, the governance and organizational infrastructure of the repository, the digital object management the repository performs, and the technology underlying the repository. The requirements are built on an international consensus involving a large number of community uh, of digital repositories, representing diverse research communities and types of repositories. Second, the Core Trust Seal uses the core requirements for trustworthy data repositories as a basis for a certification procedure. The Core Trust Seal certification is based on a peer-reviewed self-assessment with public evidence to demonstrate that the data repository meets the requirements. It is a completely transparent process as successful certifications are made publicly available and certifications are renewed every three years to account for the evolution of the requirements. The certification procedure is run by an international community and a nonprofit organization. Next slide, please, Varsha. Thank you. Core is, Core is historically a, a very old initiative. It dates back to two, 2009, when both the data seal of approval and the world data system requirements were established, already building on repository and digital preservation standards, international standards. DSA was historically strong in the social sciences and humanities domain repositories and the world data system in the earth and space sciences repository community. In 2014, under the umbrella of an RDA working group, these two standards was, were brought together, aligned with other certifications and improved with input from all stakeholders, including funders and publishers. The requirements were ultimately endorsed as an official RDA output in November 2016. The Core Trust Seal certification was then later offered, starting in November 2017, to candidate repositories. Core Trust Seal certification is positioned as an entry level in the certification landscape, as you can see again on the slide with uh, a corrupted layout, but that's not a big issue. Um, it is positioned as an entry level certification alongside the Nestor seal and ISO 16363 being more demanding certification procedures. Next slide, please, Varsha. Thank you. Core seal being an entry level uh, certification, but at the same time, it is the only trustworthiness certification that has achieved an international and diverse disciplinary uptake. Alignment and convergence, um, as you can see, um, by the way, on the slide on the right hand side, there are over 100 trustworthy digital repositories certified with the Core Seal certification. And you can see also the disciplinary and domain coverage of these repositories. At the same time, alignment and convergence on, rep on repository trustworthiness, and in particular, the Core Seal certification, can be evidenced by their wide and increasing uptake in disciplinary and generalist e-infrastructures, by funders, by publishers, policymakers, and research performing organizations worldwide, as can be seen in the examples shown on the slide. I'm not going to go into the details, but you can see for yourself on, on, on the list there. Next slide, please, Varsha. Thank you. I would like to highlight that the core requirements are implicitly aligned with and complementary to the FAIR principles, as you can see in the mapping showing on the left of this slide. In addition, as FAIR digital objects and FAIR enabling repositories assessments are being developed, core trust seal requirements will, these, will integrate these core best practices. 
Finally, on the challenges and next steps, I would like to insist on the difference between repository good practice requirements and criteria on the one hand, and repository features and characteristics which can be exposed by repository registries in a neutral way by the, on, on the other hand. For repository requirements, the consensus is that enabling trustworthiness and fair data are the baseline. When it comes to repository features and characteristics, there are a number of things that we need to look at, and I'm sure we will be discussing these later in the panel. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mustafa. I'd like to invite Marie to join us, please. Yes, hello. Can you hear and see me? Okay, yes. thank you very much. And uh, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good good evening to all of you. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm talking today on, on behalf of Science Europe, which is uh, the organization representing major public national research funding and research performing organizations from 27 countries in Europe. Um, Science Europe works together with its members to align policies and <clears throat> develop common, common guidelines and approaches. And uh, I'm talking about one of them today. Um, could you move the slide, please, Sasha? So the, the one I'm talking to you about today is, is the Science Europe uh, Guide on Research Data Management, which addresses two different uh, topics in, in one guide. One is core requirement for data management plans, and the second is the part we're going to talk about today, which is uh, criteria for the selection of trustworthy repositories. Um, this guide we started to develop, and I think that's slight correction I would want to make, which I've seen in the preprint and also on Susanna's slides, we did not publish this guide in 2021. We published this in January of 2019. Uh, the 2021 version is a second edition with an additional chapter, which is not with reference to repositories, but the original guide that's from early 2019. Um, all chapters taken together are matched to, to ensure fair data. I think it's important to know. And the motivations behind uh, this guide are, first of all, to provide direct support to researchers. So the guide has one section with direct guidance for researchers, but also to align the guidance that research performing and research funding organizations can give to their researchers. We see funders and, and performing organizations, the, the home institutions, as the first point of contact for researchers. And they are, in our opinion, best suited to, to support and, and guide the researchers in their choice of repositories. What was important to us and, and always is in, in any kind of guideline Science Europe develops is to not focus ourselves only on the Science Europe membership, but try to, to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, when we developed this guide in its first edition, starting in January 2018, um, we had a series of, of consultations and meetings and, and dialogue with different stakeholders to make sure that we include as, as many views as possible. Uh, next slide, please, Vasha. So the similarities with other efforts, um, I think the Science Europe guidelines, uh, we, we can say, are based on, on principles and practices that are really broadly accepted by the research community. Uh, the Science Europe criteria for trustworthy repositories um, are 15 different criteria grouped um, around four major topics, the provision of persistent unique identifiers, metadata uh, requirements, data access and usage licenses, and, and preservation. And uh, I think, yeah, let's move to the next slide, please, Vasha. Um, these, what I just said, are the similarities with, with other approaches. I think the biggest difference is that for us, it stops there already. We have defined these, these 15 core points alongside four topics. And Science Europe doesn't go deeper than this for, for two particular reasons. Uh, first of all, we think it's important to take into account existing initiatives that, that are there already. And Science Europe and its members would all, always recommend to researchers to refer to repositories first that are either certified, like the Core Trust Seal, like Nestor, like ISO, um, or that are discipline-specific repositories that have really broadly discipline-accepted standards in place. And the Science Europe guidelines, I think that's the, the difference from perhaps other initiatives, 
come in second place. The Science Europe guidelines are only meant in cases where a researcher cannot identify a suitable, either certified or discipline-specific repository. And we did this, um, first of all, not to duplicate any, any efforts, and, and we've been consulting a lot, for example, with the Core Trust here when we developed these guidelines, but also because we think that the researcher and their supporting organizations, be it their home institution or their funder, um, should have the flexibility to choose and have a broad flexibility to choose that is not limited. So while our criteria are far less detailed than others might be, they are in line, but the difference is we, we really limit this to what, what we think is, is core. Last slide, please, uh, Basha. The next steps, uh, open science and data sharing, yeah, stays a priority for Science Europe, and we will continue promoting open science, include data sharing, the fair principles, the trust principles as well. But for us, it's important to take into account existing initiatives. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. If there's some way already out there by another initiative that we think is, uh, is valuable, we'd rather support this and not try to duplicate efforts or work in parallel. Um, for us, this is really an important point to align policies and practices as much as possible for the sake of researchers, because if there's too many different uh, definitions and guidelines out there, it only uh, creates confusion and does not really support the researcher as it should be. An immediate next step, and also there we've been consulting with other uh, related stakeholders, will be a guideline to ensure sustainability of research data, and there again we have consulted with other uh, stakeholders to make sure that this is in line. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, I'd like to invite Darwe to join um, to join the session. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Yeah, thanks uh, organizers for the invitation. Uh, there is a lot of terminology in this session and first I want to uh, define what the trust principles focus on and, and then invite you to consider uh, using them to impact. And as uh, Reed Dalio said in his book titled uh, Trust Pr uh, Principles, and principles are the ways of handling things that happen over and over again in similar situations. So, uh, so what are in the principles should be the approaches that have repeated successes. And in this respect, the principles are slightly different from uh, core features or characteristics, which imply uh, satisfying a need and making a judgment. And uh, principles do not need to rationalize approaches for a condition, and they are the existing solutions and sometimes just need to uh, rediscover through a different lens. And so the principles should make sense to all the audience that what needs to be done uh, and not necessarily uh, <coughs> to get the consensus. And, and, uh, and trust principles are the guiding uh, principles for digital repository management. And it started by, by a group of data repository enthusiasts and to identify the essence of the most recognized issues and custom in the catchy uh, acronym and trust, uh, which is uh, also the essential value of the repositories. And, and trust has been improved over the uh, two years and then released in May 2020 and through a publication in data, in uh, sen uh, nature scientific data. Uh, next slide, uh, Washa. So the motivation of trust is first to have a unified message and let everybody know and recognize trustworthy data repository are essential. And once that message is received by everybody and uh, even you know by founders or politicians and then we can talk about how to achieve trustworthiness uh, such as following standards or providing features and the message should also include a uh, concise concise and measurable approaches to trust uh, but but verify and, and trust is built on top of uh, existing solutions so it's not trying to replace them uh, and trust uh, message is to help and promote uh, and, and advocate for the, the, the trustworthy uh, data repositories. And next slide. And, and trust principle seems uh, making sense to a lot of people. And so far we have uh, uh, received like 40 
endorsements from all kinds of stakeholders that you can think of, like founders, or repositories, and publishers, professional organizations. Uh, please still uh, endorse Trust uh, if you don't uh, have done, done so, uh, and the more the better. And, uh, and also, I should mention that the Trust uh, is beyond uh, uh, Right, uh, RDA and uh, and a trust paper uh, has more than uh, fifteen thousand views and then thirty five scholar citations uh, in uh, less than a year and that has been translated into uh, five languages and and now it's, it's sort of become their own life now uh, and a uh, next slide and the relationship between trust and others uh, uh, probably we'll talk about today is that the trust is inspirational goals. And, uh, and then the framework and implementations uh, are on how to achieving these goals. And uh, next slide. And so far ba uh, based on the uh, survey of the trust endorsers and, uh, and what is the impact that the, uh, the trust have so far. And mostly is to uh, reaffirm a leadership's commitment to supporting trust uh, worthy data repository and also reinforce repository's mission to adhere to the best practices and, and the message is consistent with the um, uh, with the reason founders support uh, like the research data canada's sponsored trust uh, symposium and an age uh, just released the uh, the funding to provide uh, to, to improve the uh, the uh, repository trustworthiness uh, and, and, and next slide. And, uh, and then we also see uh, some creative use of trust principles uh, recently. And, uh, and then the, on the slide is that the, uh, the repository only use a few slides and to, uh, to, to present their effort uh, to be trustworthy. And I don't want you to uh, uh, look into the slide, but I just see like how they kind of mapping the work to the trust and you know, like each letters. And next slide. And the next uh, steps uh, are will be continued to uh, promote uh, and uh, make awareness of the trust, uh, the trust principle to people, and uh, and also um, at the uh, uh, at this RDA we'll talk more uh, in the uh, the certification of a repository uh, uh, interest group uh, session in breakout uh, five. So please join us, and uh, and then to find gaps. To like say what what are the principles are need a little bit more work and then uh, I think the transparency and then sustainability are the, the most uh, two challenging uh, principles and uh, and also like we want more examples for people to show how they uh, they use uh, trust principles and then uh, again I think the same like, like other uh, speakers are trying to kind of align together and work together and thank you thanks very much Dawei. Um, um, I can invite okay. Kathleen to join us um, and I think just to let everyone know I think we're about five minutes behind because we started a little bit late but we'll be aiming to wrap this up by five minutes past the hour thank you trying to get my camera on but it's not working we, we can work earlier yeah, we can hear Perhaps you. Perhaps I'll just then. go ahead without my camera then. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, it's early in the morning here anyway, so <laughs> maybe it's better not to have my camera on. Um, th uh, thanks, first of all, for inviting me to uh, present in this session. Uh, my name is Kathleen Shearer, and I'm the executive director of CORE, which is the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. Um, we're an international organization, um, association. We have members from and partners from over 150 countries um, on all five continents. And we represent a broad community of, of repositories. Um, next slide, please, Varsha. So um, we, in, it was actually last year that we um, developed this core community framework for good practices in repositories. And it was really prompted by two things. One was the OSTP consultation on um, desirable characteristics for repositories. And a, a second sort of underlying 
issue was that there were a lot of these um, good practice frameworks around, including, you know, core trust seal and the fair principles and so on. But we we had a sense from our community that um, it they were finding it difficult to na navigate these different um, frameworks. So we wanted to bring them together into a single uh, a single framework, and also that the bar was too high for some of these. So I think, for example, the core trust seal is is kind of the gold standard, but many in the reposit many repositories. Um, are not able to comply with core trust seal practices at the moment. So we wanted to f to create a framework that was more achievable for um, the the repository community in general. And you know the values underlying the work that we were doing really was, of course, to improve practices in existing repositories, but also to bring the repository community together um, in a, a very diverse community together. So we want to ensure that we're creating this global knowledge commons and that we're not, um, uh, again, having a too high of a bar for repositories. <clears throat> so that um, especially repositories in developing countries are dismissed or disqualified from participating in open science. Um, and distribution is key to this as well as sustainability. Um, so next slide, please, Varsha. So um, the framework um, is, is similar to other, uh, um, other uh, existing frameworks because it's really built on um, recommendations from the core trust seal, from the FAIR principles, from uh, the core next generation repository recommendations. So it's uh, not really bringing anything new to the table, but rather bringing things together from uh, other initiatives. And then what we did was we vetted them with a large community of repositories internationally to see what was really achievable and relevant <clears throat> across a, a large number of types of repositories and region. And I think something that was very important for us was to um, rationalize what we were doing. <laughs> and this is important for the community to, to, to understand as well. So each recommendation is connected to a specific, specific objective like discovery, access, use, reuse, integrity, quality assurance, and so on. Um, there's been quite a bit of uptake by the community of the, the framework already. Um, it's been translated into eight different languages, and I think it's being used quite actively in, in a number of different countries and regions. And the idea is that we will review it every summer with an international um, uh, group and incorporate anything new that's come onto the horizon that we think is relevant, um, as well as taking a look, you know, and assessing the, the capacities of repositories as they e expand and, and grow. Um, okay, next slide, thank you. So in conclusion, I think um, I'd like to echo what Mustafa said is um, it's important to understand that there's a difference between features and best practices. So best practices are really good quality practices in repositories, whereas features are a specific functionality that we would like to um, adopt. Um, and the aim of, of good practices in, in, in our context at core is really to, again, support the improvement of repository operations, not to disqualify them from participating in the ecosystem. And, um, you know, the we have to be very sensitive that if the bar is too high, this will be harmful and slow down our collective progress towards open science. Um, so I think, you know, for example, in the developing countries, we're not going to see a lot of domain repositories. Open science is going to roll out based on institutional repositories because those are the long lived institutions and organizations in developing countries. So any global initiatives that's looking to, uh, you know, uh, support or define criteria, features or characteristics really need to understand the situations in different countries and different regions and take note of that and be sensitive to that. 
So again, like um, I think what we really need to do is strike a balance between uh, adopting good practices, encouraging good practices, but also being inclusive and recognizing the challenges in, in, in different countries and different regions. So in terms of next steps, um, uh, I, I think my next steps here are really about how we can work together as a community to move forward with our various initiatives. So I think really we need to build on the existing best practices that already exist, like Core Trust Seal. We need to clearly explain and justify any new recommendation, recommendations we want to introduce into the community, and we need to consult with the community widely, ensure that um, developing countries are part of the conversation and that all feedback from the community is shared publicly. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Kathleen. Um, and if I can ask uh, Jerry to um, unmute himself and to make his camera visible if possible. Thank you so much, Jerry. Yep, thank you. Pleasure to be uh, part of the panel today. Uh, so I'm going to give you a perspective from the, the National Institutes of Health in the United States, from the NIH, uh, but it's also going to provide some insight into activities that are taking place across the, the U.S. federal government, particularly the science funding agencies, and um, you know, of which there are there are more than 20 agencies that uh, that provide funding for research and development in in all fields of science and technology. What motivated uh, a, a lot of this work, people may uh, recognize, is that at the end of October, NIH issued a, uh, a new data management and sharing policy that essentially requires any uh, researcher seeking funding from NIH to provide a data management and sharing plan that outlines the kinds of data to be collected in their studies, the way that they will preserve it for the long term, the ways that they will make it accessible uh, to the research community, taking into account necessary limitations. And as part of that, an expectation that data would be managed and shared in established repositories. Uh, we recognized as well from a lot of the public consultation that we had done that there was uh, there would be a desire as a need in the community for greater guidance and direction about how do I identify, how does research identify a, an appropriate repository uh, for their research data. And so in some of the, the so-called supplemental information that was released along with the policy, NIH outlined something of a, a three-part tiered strategy for selecting a data repository that's summarized here on this slide. In some cases, whether it's for particular kinds of data or around particular research funding programs, NIH may in fact designate a particular repository. If you're receiving funding for a project of this type, the data should go in this repository on these timelines and so forth. The, the second tier then was recognizing there'd be a lot of data for which we would not have a specific designation, uh, but there's a preference for putting data in a discipline and data specific repositories. And in fact, I have a link on my slide here to a, to a list that NIH keeps of, of data repositories that NIH supports that are open to submissions of, of relevant data. And that's the, the second tier. We then realized too, there was a lot of data that wasn't gonna fit in those 80 or so uh, disciplinary repositories that are on that list. And so we, we called for um, or allow for the use of other repositories that meet what's called a set of desirable characteristics. And this set of desirable characteristics, in fact, we hope will apply to, to the, the upper echelons, if you will, in this hierarchy as well, uh, but lay out some guidelines for a researcher in choosing a repository, whether they're going to put it in a, in a generalist repository, in an institutional repository, or other that might be uh, present in their, their discipline. So let me walk through those with you quickly. So let's go to the next slide. To say that these desirable characteristics were worked out across the federal agencies, and some of you might have, um, I think was mentioned already, the OSTP request for comment. The, the motivations for for doing so was to come up with a consensus set of characteristics of, across the U.S. federal funding uh, bodies so we provide more consistent information to the research community about how to, how to choose uh, a data repository. Thought this would make life simpler, uh, less complex for researchers, and a way to, to ensure that the criteria were aligned with uh, fair data and fair data principles, as well as our own data management and sharing expectations. 
And in a way, I say on the slide in the bottom point, raising the standards for existing repositories. In some regards, it's like lowering the or raising the floor. So we want to ensure that repositories meet a basic set of characteristics, noting that there'll be some that exceed them by quite some margin. Let's go to the next slide. So the general framing is we identified a number of high level, what we called characteristics. Some of them could be considered features, but they're not a, an exhaustive set of design criteria. We don't tell you how to implement uh, these characteristics in a particular repository. In fact, we anticipate that implementation would vary considerably across repositories, depending on which disciplines they serve, the kinds of users and so forth that uh, make use of the repository. We tried to come up with characteristics that could be somewhat enduring, but noting that we would update them uh, as technology changes and in particular as data sharing practices continue to evolve. And to the extent possible, I'll say we based them on existing uh, certification criteria and others, recognizing that those certification criteria might, might represent a, a high point in implementation. Let's go to the next slide, please. So, I don't want to dwell on the on the individual characteristics themselves. We identified some that would be present for all data repositories. I think consistent with many of these we've seen in previous presentations, assigning persistent identifiers for a whole host of good reasons, uh, having broad measured terms of, of reuse. So it doesn't characteristics here that you can try to compare with some of the other uh, presentations we've seen today. We also, let's go to the next slide identified additional criteria that we thought would be necessary for repositories that have human subjects data, uh, ensuring that the fidelity to the original informed consents approaches for protecting privacy and security uh, and, and, and detecting breaches of, of uh, privacy and security principles and so forth. Let's go to the next slide, which I think is my uh, last. So next uh, for next steps. So as you've seen, NIH has adopted these desired characteristics into the policy that it issued. We anticipate that other agencies will adopt them into their, uh, into their guidance materials as well. Most other agencies have a data management and sharing policy. Some are in the midst of, of revising and updating those. So we hope that these will have much broader applicability across the US federal landscape. Uh, and what we'd like to do next is make them more visible to the research community, to the data management community, to the RDA community, part of my presence here today, uh, and then look for ways to help repositories, in fact, become more consistent with these characteristics. In fact, there are some funding opportunities available from NIH to help do that with existing data repositories, uh, and we hope that this will help, uh, help disseminate uh, good practices across the uh, across the repository ecosystem. And of course, we have uh, almost two years before the NIH data management and sharing policy becomes active. It'll apply to, to awards after January 20, uh, 2023. So we're trying to have a lot of interaction with different communities and help us identify what additional guidance might be helpful. So your suggestions are welcome and I look forward to the discussion today. Thanks very much, Jerry. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Rebecca Lawrence now to facilitate. Thank you. Hopefully, I think my camera's decided not to work as well. So apologies. Hopefully, it'll start working shortly. Um, so can I ask all the speakers to come um, onto the screen? And actually, Varsha, I think we probably can stop sharing the slide for now so that we can see each other. Hopefully this is going to work. Um, can um, I ask? Sorry, I've got echo. Well then, but can I ask anybody who has any questions to please put them rather than put them in the Q and A? Can you put them in the shared document, please? And that will then help us capture them all because we don't have a huge amount of time. But we would but like we would to capture the question. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, can, um, I can I ask you all to mute, mute for the time, the time being, being? Because hopefully that will get rid of the echo. echo. Sorry. Sorry. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't. Okay. okay. Um, so um, thank, so thank you, you very much for all the great talks. talks. Um, um, clearly, there's an awful, awful lot of work going on, and particularly pulling together existing work and criteria. To bring, to bring about consensus, about consensus within, within your individual, individual areas. areas. But obviously, but there's obviously still there's a lot still of different, different efforts. efforts. 
Um, um, and, and so my first, my first question, question is that the, the aim, aim of this, of this session, session is to is really to identify, identify a common, a common set, set of core repository, repository features, features and characteristics, and characteristics uh, that can be that used can to describe repository, repository capabilities, capabilities that all that stakeholders, all stakeholders want, to see. want to see. And so, and so my first my question first is, do you agree that that's, that that's a, good a good thing, good thing for us to be doing? doing? And what, and do, what you do you see, see as the main benefits, benefits of that? Who wants to go first? I, I, I can start, start. Rebecca, Rebecca. Well, well, despite, despite the whole echo. echo. <laughs> I, hope I hope this is going to be an understandable, understandable discussion, discussion anyway. anyway. <laughs> so, if so if we're, we're talking, talking about, about core features and characteristics to describe repositories um, and not to put any requirements on registries, then yes, I would say it's, um, it's a good thing to do. Um, and as it happens, we have already um, a good starting point with existing metadata schemas to describe repositories in registries like um, read 3 data and fair sharing. As you said, there is already work ongoing regarding the requirements for good practices, but I see again, this is quite different from features and characteristics to describe repositories in a neutral way in registries. So, um, in terms of the benefits, definitely, if we are able to describe repositories in an appropriate way that would satisfy many stakeholders in re repository registries, this would greatly facilitate finding an appropriate re repository for users. Uh, basically, if the more you expose the characteristics and the capabilities of repositories in those registries, the more you facilitate um, for the users the selection of repositories based on the criteria they feel are important for their data set. Not all data sets need the same level of care and curation. Um, not all data sets will have the same uh, funding, uh, sorry, requirements coming from funders or requirements coming from the disciplinary community needs. So yeah, if we're talking about characteristics to describe repositories and registries, definitely coming up with a, a, a common set of uh, uh, features and characteristics to describe these repositories in the, in, 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 the, in the best way would benefit the community. Great. Thank you, Mustafa. Who, who else would like to speak? Do you want to put your hand up and then I can go round you? Kathleen. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, just building on what Mustafa said, I, I think, you know, encouraging. So I would say it's important to encourage good practices. That's extremely important. Um, it's it's really about how those feet, how they're being applied and whether they're going to be applied in a way that again disqualifies a large number of the existing repositories. So again, I think what we want to do is really promote good practices. I mean, I love that NIH has funding to support um, adoption of good practices in the repository community, but if it, it, uh, we need to be very, very sensitive about how they're applied because, you know, at the moment we don't have enough repositories to support widespread data uh, sharing and data management. We have probably, I don't know, 10% of the repositories that are needed. So we need a lot more repositories to su support data sharing and data management in a very comprehensive way. And therefore, if we, we uh, like I if the bar is very high and it's applied in a very strict way, then what we will end up doing is um, inhibiting the, the, um, the adoption of open science uh, widely. And that will especially impact developing countries. It will have an impact on you know, our ability to um, uh, achieve the sustainable de development goals. It will have a, 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 a quite a negative impact all around. Yes, makes a lot yeah, of sense. Do I? Do I? Yeah, I think I think I just want to uh, add uh, a top of, uh, on top of uh, Mustafa and, and uh, Kathy said. I think the uh, to identify a core set of characteristics is a useful thing, but uh, we also need to recognize uh, it is a evolving thing. It's not like we get this thing and then we're done. And then that's a, and also I think what the trust principles is about, is, and and cultural seal is evolving as well. 
So uh, I, I think that is is more sort of like the uh, what is the uh, the current major current needs, and uh, once we identify them, and then uh, then we we kind of work on that and improve uh, them in the in the future. Jerry. Yeah, maybe to echo something uh, Kath Kathleen and others had, had said, I think as, as long as many of us feel like we've been working on improving data and data management, we're still in the very, very early stages, right? So there's still a lot of data for which there is not a, uh, say, I think there is a repository to take every uh, data from every research study. However, we still have a long way to go to come up with a quality data ecosystem. And I think we do want to have some guidance as to, to how to start, but recognizing this, and this may be the difference between characteristics and good practice, that good practice is gonna to continue to evolve over time. I think there are certain functions, capabilities we can see for now that we'll want, have a persistent identifier. There are good ways and not so good ways to do that. Over time, I think we wanna we want to move practice from good to better in each of these areas. And we probably wanna look at the features that we need as we start to do more with the data, we see more reuse. Uh, and we see more sharing and combination of data. So I can imagine that both the, the lists of features, the good practices within them are gonna continue to evolve over time. And having some core principles to help guide us, I think is also uh, interesting. So it's, it's like we've triangulated around the, uh, the development of a data repository ecosystem. So thank you. Um, so in, in, in my work, there are, there's sometimes confusion around repositories and registries and and some of the people already try not to answer that but actually look at what function it serves and 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 i think in in defining the core features or core characteristics do we do we actually ask ourselves what functions does it serve and what motivates each of the repository or the registries um and and i think um we we we, we can agree that we have to separate out the labels from from the functions and and when we we, we are in the, the the learning progress right that everyone is learning here and there and and i i found that in in my work what what works best um as guided by a lot of experts who some of them are on this 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 line is we look at the the best practices for what what are we trying to do so we come up with the list of things that if we want to perform a task, then we go to this set of recommendations instead of trying to find one universal minimal core characteristics. And I'm not sure if, if this might be one of the options at the table that we could explore on things that could be pragmatic at work. Okay, uh, Marie. I think, Going back to, to the, the pure definition of, of core common understanding, I think it, it's really about the core and, and not going too much into detail because as more detail we, we add, the more restrictive we get. And I, restrictive for me meaning in, in to sense, uh, to senses, not to exclude any repositories. Uh, I think Matthew, you said that at the beginning of your speech, uh, there's a lot of institutional repositories that are very well placed to, to be the best choice for a researcher. However, if we define too much into detail, they might be excluded or many of them might be excluded. And then in, in the second sense of not being too restrictive, uh, Dawai said the same, also the, the entire repository landscape is evolving. And the more detailed we fix what should be common criteria, the more we limit this, this evolving landscape because any new evolvement might not be in these criteria. So I, I would really call to, to go back to what is really core, what is absolutely needed, and then I'm talking about what is absolutely needed from the researcher's point of view. Yes, okay. Um, Chris or Matthew, is there anything you want to add, Chris? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so the last thing that you just said, Maria, making it um, taking into consideration what it is that the researcher needs to do, uh, triggered for me um, because it's. I think it's fair to say that the practice of sharing data is not as widespread as we would like it to to be, and 
um, publishers sort of operate at the downstream end of all of the thinking that needs to be done about data management and data sharing. So when publishers come to thinking about how to support and enable more data sharing and therefore achieve the kind of open science goals that you know, we're all pointing towards, I think it's, well, fair for us to acknowledge that many of the researchers who we might be talking to and might be asking questions about data sharing won't really have done it before. And they're going to need some, you know, support here. Now, um, speaker from Science Europe, it was you, Marie, said that um, funders and organisations where researchers work are probably best placed to advise researchers on where to um what to do with their data and i think you're right there um that's upstream but many of them come to us a long way downstream and ask us questions so i think so the, the point here is that i'm I, I do agree that we need simple ways to recommend that researchers then go and choose the repositories that they want to use but i'm wondering whether you know that's a pretty hard job um, because many of the people that we see as publishers should have engaged with this already. So yeah, that's my sort of small observation around this start of the discussion. Yes, that's a good point. And it's how we get researchers to think about these things upstream, because almost by the time they get to publication, it's 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 almost too late for them to be thinking about some of these yeah. elements. Um, really pleased that many of you actually oh kathleen do you want to to just come back on that before i move on to the next question yeah well i was just going to add that i think um to maria to marie's point about only identifying what really has to be the core characteristics because not only are there differences in um you know um, domains, there are differences across countries and across regions, there may be pri different priorities in terms of where data, where a researcher would want to place their data based on where they live, what institution they're at, what domain they're in. So again, I, I just wanted to support what Marie said around the core, identifying core characteristics across maybe our different communities, and then leaving a lot of flexibility for for researchers uh, in terms of how that rolls out in their own local context. Great, yes. So, I mean, one of the things I was really pleased that actually many of you have been talking about is about you know, working collaboratively together and also really highlighting, and I see it in the chat as well, around what we're doing here it ultimately is to help um, support researchers and support them in, in the sharing of the research. So I guess the question is, you know, I think over the last few months, it's, it seemed like there's become, to some extent, increasing competition between some of these different efforts. Um, and, you know, it, it's to sometimes sort of move to sort of more positioning statements rather than collaboration. And I just wonder how, given that we all sound like here, that we want to work together, and obviously we're all working towards supporting the research at the centre of this. We're all important stakeholders around this. We all have you know, different angles and different needs, but ultimately this is about supporting researchers. How do you think we can move towards um, working in a, in a much more collaboratively collaborative way whilst understanding the fact that we all have different needs around us as different stakeholders. Uh, I think Surat was first and then Mustafa. Thank you. Um, so, so I think one observation that I, I heard throughout the past hour is that there are two layers of of activities for data management and data sharing for research, right? There's the planning of it, which is the, how do we, we, we set out a plan from the get go on at the end, so that the repository is not the end of everything, but it's actually the beginning of where a lot of research starts as well, reflected in the chat as well here. So, so there's the top level planning here, and then there's the second layer here of the implementation of it that we kind of rely on the, 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 the researchers to, to do. And, and I think now that we have seven, eight people on the panels looking at different criteria, I think it might be helpful to look at how we how we set out the, the research data management in the first place 
and we answer ourselves again what 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 do the researchers for this specific problem are looking to do and then from from that plan we can we can start teasing out which best practice or recommendations or which criteria we could we could go forward to and 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 therefore we 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 aren't really having a competing interest here because as i mentioned that the way that i look at the different criteria here we we we're, we're driven by different motivations and mission and then that also set out the second layers of how do we implement the fair enough to be to 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 be data sharing capable at the technical levels. Mustafa, I think he wanted to come in. Yeah, Rebecca, uh, first, th thanks for the question. Um, I would actually challenge your statement that there is polarization and competition between the different initiatives. Uh, I think we've seen, and the, all the presentations that we had are a good evidence for that, that there is convergence in, in the community around good practices for repositories. This is um, something that has emerged uh, quite some time ago in, in the field of data preservation, in the field of um, um, fair data management more recently. So there is already convergence in the community. So I, I don't think there is competition and polarization. And if you're alluding to uh, the recent position statement that was issued by a number of organizations recently in response to the Criteria That Matter paper, this was exactly because there was confusion. And it seems there is still confusion between the different people involved here in the discussion between what we talk about in terms of features and characteristics to describe repositories seen from a registry um, perspective and good community, uh, good practices, good community frameworks for repositories. For the, the, the framework for good practices for repositories, I think this is legitimately an area where repositories and their users, the researchers they serve, are in, should be in the driving seat in defining those, those good community practices. And other stakeholders are obviously involved in this, such as publishers, and they have needs. They need to fulfill some needs in terms of interconnections with repositories and so on. And the, and the publishers can be part of that dialogue and that discussion. And they can say, we need these needs to be supported for this and that reason. And we need to, this to be integrated maybe in good community um, uh, practices. So I think there's no polarization, no competition. I think there's collaboration already. And, um, and it's open, as it was evidenced before, the requirements are open for input from stakeholders, so they can be improved. And so this is one side of the equation. The other side being the characteristics to describe the repositories. And I see this as something that should be completely neutral. When you describe repositories, you describe them in a neutral way. And you use for that a metadata schema. And that's it. And, and registries can uh, discuss this, and maybe we can take this discussion forward later. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, Mustafa. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my echoes. Sorry, back. My echoes Huawei, back. Huawei, and then Jerry. And Jerry. Uh, yeah, I think I, I want to also, uh, I think, uh, address the question from the point of view is uh, it's not about competition; it's about the messaging. And I think the, like, for example, the, uh, the data repository standard has been there for decades. Uh, you know, OAS has been coming from the space uh, science and now it's like using by all the disciplines and the culture seal is based on that. And so, so I think what the challenge is, is now there's a lot of fields and uh, they cannot understand the language. So they kind of like mapping it really to use their domain knowledge and domain language to redescribe what is the core things that already have consensus by the community. I think there is a that's the element I see is the challenging right now. I think there, like you know, actually, for example, biomedical field has not been using certification at all, like in the past three until the last uh, the the three years ago. So the uh, and then now have the repository certified, and then they have the examples, have the languages to to. to describe what is the core functionality. So I, I want, I think, the, uh, to bring the attention that see how if we kind of say the, the, uh, the same thing with different languages and how we kind of uh, 
uh, unify with the, you know, with our thought. And that's what the trust principle were trying to, to do is, you know, like so we don't have a lot of uh, uh, the principle, just, just, you know, try to unify the language. Thank you. Jerry and then Kathleen. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I mean, I think I'll go back to my kind of early days comment again, even though we feel like we've been doing this for a long time. The um, right NIH just issued its, its, its data management and sharing policy updating something that had been around for a what, since 2005. I mean, I think what you're seeing are, are different uh, stakeholders who are all trying to sort out the situation, right? And I can say that from the, the U.S. government side within NIH, we knew if we wanted to move forward on data management and sharing, putting that at the beginning of the process, not at the end, as, as some were saying, we needed to come up with some better guidance for our community to help them uh, to, to facilitate and enable uh, data management and sharing, helping them sort through the, the the data repository choices that they have. So, I mean, we did aim to be inclusive in the process. We, the OSTP request for comment that went out, I think, did a reasonably good job, as, as well as any of those kinds of processes can do, of bringing in a diverse set of perspectives. We heard from publishers, we heard from research communities, we heard from other other funding agencies, and so forth. So, I think you can look at that as a as a first step from a, a funding agency side, but a name to be, as we see now with the, the publishers have, have been putting together. And I think there are other groups represented here that have been working this space. It's sort of like, we now have the, the basis for figuring out new ways to collaborate and to come up with the commonality because the, to me, it's easy to talk about in, in principles. Yes, we all want fair data repositories, but as you see, we are all coming at it from slightly different angles, right? From features to best practices to characteristics. I think there's a lot of commonality across them at a, at a certain level. And of course, down at the, the details, there may be some different words and language. So I think we can now almost take the set that we have today. And I you know, compliment you for putting together this panel, which is very inclusive of a lot of views. Can we come up on something that, as people have been putting in the chat, the research community buys into, because we're trying to support them. I'd say we're trying to support other data users as well, some of whom may be outside the research community, so to speak, but others who are going to make use of the research data that we have. And how do we come up with ways that are, you know, reasonably simple, allow continued innovation and evolution in the, the data repository ecosystem, but in ways that the, all the communities can support and find serve their needs. So let's, let's do it. <laughs> Sounds good, Jerry. Thank you. Kathleen. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to um, uh, also mention this uh, position statement um, and why we issued that position statement. I, and I think um, so one of the issues really is about how these criteria and I mentioned this earlier, how these practice good practice criteria will be applied. And I think that was a major concern um, when the publishers um, came out with the um, uh, selection criteria that matter, it, there was a big concern that they would be applied in a way that would again disqualify uh, a, a large portion of the existing repositories. So I, there's two issues here. There's one, what are the characteristics that we all agree on? Um, and we may have some that we all agree on and some that we, we have that are um, unique to our own communities. But then the other issue, which is very important, and can have a really practical impact on, on um, the repository community and, and researchers' access to repositories is how those are applied in practice. So I think we need to have both of those things on our, um, our uh, plate to discuss with each other. Yes, and I know Matt wants to come in. I guess one of my points was really about how we we discuss these things together and maybe, you know, the, it, it, you know if there were concerns around some of what some of the, the groups are doing, whether it's better to have a conversation around it rather than sort of, you know, really put it up at a high level where it where it's then everybody putting statements out. Whereas actually, I'm sure if we got in a room and had a conversation, I think for, from what I've seen of the, the revisions around the preprint, I think it was actually more of a misunderstanding in terms of how, you know, it was worded. But I will I will let Matt talk to that. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. So, yeah, I think I just wanted to well, firstly, just echo and support what Mustafa said initially, and then Jerry following on. I think there's definitely room to be collaborative. We definitely want to be supportive, and we all 
have different stakeholders and different groups that we're supporting, probably sometimes the same people at different stages of their research process. And I think it's even more important that the advice that they get at all the stages of their process is the same and complementary, rather than them being told different things by different people at different stages of the process. Because as people have said in the chat and people have said in the questions, like there's still not enough data in repositories. We still have lots of work to do to get more people doing that. And we all have levers that we can pull, um, whether that's, yeah, putting in data management plans, whether it's getting material out of supplementary files and into proper repositories. And obviously there'll be things to, um, yeah, things that we can all do to, to work on that. And I would agree with Rebecca that part of the thing that Chris and I are trying to say is that we're happy to be in a room and have this these conversations because we think there is a problem to solve here and we're, we're happy to do that collaboratively um, and would rather not be having to issue statements and things. So yeah, I think we're here to work collaboratively. Um, I'm conscious of the... Sorry, can, can, can oh, I quickly Oh, yes, add? of course. Oh, I didn't yeah. see your hand. Go for it. Yeah, so, so um, I'd like to echo with, with Jerry and I'd like to share a specific example because um, the European commissions do share the NH, con NH concerns around data management um, that is kind of guided from the top level down and then being pushed up from the implementation from the bottom up. Um, if I may give an, in, um, an example uh, of the data research management toolkit um, that is developed by Converge project at the EC. And this is what, what I am hearing is A, we are learning from each other. And, and, and what I find is that use cases are important and, and we can apply that. So 70% when, when, when you look at the data research management plan, they, they are common, but then there are the 30% bits that are very specific to specific question. So can we learn the, the commonality from the other projects? And that's one part of things that is is being taken care of in the Converse RDM kit where you learn from the use cases and then you identify, okay, these are the specific best practices and community guidelines that one can adopt. And then the second thing that I'm hearing here is we are we have to separate out, are we a developer of the repository or the use of repositories? So that's, again, coming back to the developer and users circle. And are we defining these com common features based on which views? And that, again, goes in circle on how to implement from the bottom up. So I, I know that Susanna Sansone um, leads the, the, the initiative around the FAIR cookbook, where this is now very technical and specific to what you want to do in terms of data sharing, what specific activities are at hand. And I think, I think all of us on this panel can accommodate the best practices in these different scenarios. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm conscious of the time. I think we are probably, given we start a little bit late, we're going to run over just a few minutes. I hope that's okay with people, um, but we won't run over too far. Susanna, is there anything you want to flag? I know there were some questions going up into the chat as well. Is there anything you want to flag from there? Sorry, I put my, my, <laughs> my audio on. Well, not particularly. Yes, there is a discussion about uh, where to continue the conversation uh, there is a group of people that say we need a new group uh, well i was wondering uh, do we need a new group i mean certainly obviously the work was initiated then by the fair sharing working group which obviously it's also important and is kept in because the, the rationale was exactly to uh, understand how to extend the registry which is an adopted output so we'll be definitely very open and interesting to understand how we move forward in this sense. So then we open to people. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so maybe um, if we continue, I mean, as you say, there's there's a number of, of um, uh, mentions in the chat, but also many of you have, have suggested, you know, and, and seem to agree with the idea of trying to put together a really core, core minimum um, set of features and characteristics that we can all then, um, you know, have our additional um, 
elements that we need for our particular um, uh, stakeholder group. Um, but what are your thoughts in terms of how we work together towards um, doing that? I mean, is it a matter of pulling this group together, whether it's this working group or another working group, or whatever, and actually just sitting around the table and, and looking at what each other have, have put together and trying to find that common set? And are there other groups that need to be in this conversation that you're aware of that aren't uh, in it uh, as, we, as we we sit here today we need to pull in Mustafa and then Marie yeah I just wanted to come to come here on, on this question of two two things this the scope of the work we need to be really clear on what we want to do here because I still again feel there is a confusion on what this maybe new working group or what this work should entail um, again from my perspective, working on a set core, or a core set of features to describe repositories in a neutral way, again, not criteria for good practices, is something that's worth doing. And it has to involve all the registries that could make use of this common set of features. So from that point of view, and also it needs to involve the repositories themselves to start with. Um, and the other stakeholders like publishers, funders, and so on and so forth. But if we define the scope very precisely and avoid the scope creep, then yes, I think we can agree on what piece of work needs to be done. And I would, uh, um, I would advocate that a new working group is needed because it involves more registries than just fair sharing. It involves the repositories, it involves many stakeholders, and I think they need to be brought into this discussion on the core set of features to describe repositories. Mustafa. Uh, Marie, I think you had your hand up. Uh, yes, I, I think it's really short because actually Mustafa said everything I <laughs> wanted to say as well. So just to, to underline, and, and we did that in our latest statement uh, from the Science Euro set, we are very open to, to sit around the table and discuss in whatever format if there is a clearly defined scope. And I would really like to underline also looking at the panelists today, uh, the repositories should be around the table. And I think they are not well enough represented for this topic for the time being. Uh, Jerry, uh, just just to say, obviously the repositories need to be involved. I think as we're again, maybe we're thinking about what the purpose is. We need to have the research community involved too, because I think part of what we're trying to do is solve their problem, right? How do I there, how do I sort through the the repository choices available to me to find good ones, right? Uh, that are going to enable my data to be fair and enable others to to make use of it and. Um, I will say that was part of the lens that NIH looked at and some of the other agencies when we were preparing our, our characteristics, knowing that there's um, there are lots of new uh, capabilities, there are lots of long-standing repositories people were very familiar with, but you know how can we provide some guidance to them and I think understanding their needs, some of the confusion and uncertainty they may have, and then I mean putting them together with research uh, with the repository community as well, who can kind of sort through. Uh, even what some good practices, I think, are uh, to, to support the uh, researchers' needs. So let's not leave them out. Perfect. Any other comments? Chris? Just some vigorous agreement there um, with the bringing in the, rep the, the different communities, but also recognize, I had thought that Coar, Kathleen, that you represented the repository community. So it may be that, um, maybe that's what you mean, Jerry, when you mean bringing in the communities. Maybe you mean bringing in representatives of the communities. And I think that's you know, naturally critically important. Okay, makes sense. So, um, sorry, Kathleen, was, was that your hand up? Maybe I didn't, no, it wasn't, sorry. Um, so uh, I don't want to put, everybody on the spot per se, but it would be useful to get a sense whether you think you would be keen to be part of a group that, that works together, obviously needing to bring in some of these other parties as well. Um, we are, Obviously we need to define, as quite rightly pointed out, stuff exactly the, the detail of this, but um, to work together to try and come together around a, a sort of minute, minimum set 
Um, so what, what's people's senses? Is that something that you'd be willing? It sounds like some of you certainly uh, sound to be willing. Uh, actually, can I ask in the meantime, please, Basha, please. If, you can, if you can share the last slide, Basha, while people talk, we can show the last slide as a summary. Thank you. So is that general support or not so sure at this point? General support, I think. <laughs> good. Well, that's a good sign. Brilliant. OK, so I'm going to pass back over to Susanna to just give us a quick wrap up and next steps. Thank you ever so much, everybody. Thank you very much. Varsha, do you mind to please? Are you still there? Vasha? Yes. Oh. No, no. Hi, I'm here. Um, the last slide doesn't have anything on it, though, the one that I downloaded. Oh, uh, sorry. If you can actually go on the, the Google the Google document. It might. If you're there, it might be easier for you to share your screen. That's a good point. <laughs> it's going to take uh, me a while to get there. Sorry. Got it. Okay. Right here. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, thank if you. somebody sorry. has it. Thank you. I'm straight to take too many things. Take notes and responding. Yeah, I think it's a very good idea, Joy. If people can add support and interest in participating in the notes, that would be great. I was also suggesting that people would indeed register. Yes, thank you so much. If you can put in presenter mode, that will help. I'm trying. <laughs> so in, the, in, in the meantime, I can uh, quickly go over what I took as a very level uh, summary. So. Uh, there is a willingness to work together. Uh, there is a willingness of identifying this core characteristic only by leaving the rest to the different group. Fair enough that they're doing. The idea of bringing all parties essential uh, repository owner, we all agree, as well as uh, other relevant registry, absolutely. Uh, so there is also a need for clarifying feature versus best practice, and perhaps we could work together on those defining those terms. Uh, we all agree that we need to be very sensitive how we apply those ultimately, especially when registry apply them. Like we say, we have a long way to go for having good data and a good quality ecosystem, which means we need to foster the development of new repositories. We want, don't want to scare anybody off, let alone the small repository. Um, the landscape is indeed evolving, so we shouldn't have things which are fixed. We need to be evolved uh, um, on those feature and practice fair enough. And everything has to reflect the research need. In terms of next steps, obviously, this working group, it's in maintenance mode. Uh, there has been a discussion of converting the group in an interest group, but I'm very open if people want to create a new interest group or a new working group. Obviously, uh, as for sharing activity, we would like to be involved. Uh, perhaps as a direct next step of this uh, session and the panel, and thank you very much for Lord to attend and present, we could write up a summary of the, the of very quick summary of the discussion with the speaker and any interest party to make sure we clarify the wording and we present these different efforts and we define this terminology, feature best, best practice. And that can be the base of this new group, working group or interest group. I will definitely in the meantime suggest that you register to the working group the mailing list so that we make sure that we can share the information, we can share this report and we get engaged and we get the discussion going in whatever group will be next. Does it sound like a good summary or have I misinterpreted everybody comment? Anyone comment? Okay, don't hear anything. So I'm assuming then uh, everybody it's you know, agrees and it's happy with the conclusion. So thank you for the, the plus one in the chat. Well, with this, I really would like to thank again, uh, first of all, my uh, um, uh, fellow chairs, as well as all the speakers, especially those who woke up very early in the morning, put the slide together and presented. And thank you all for you to attend. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.